Okay, so let's go back to where everyone has, uh, will have experience in, which is echocardiography, whether you're in imaging or not. You all are supposed to uh, uh, have experience with echo. So in the next 10, 15 minutes, we're gonna be talking about the basics of echocardiography and Doppler physics. So um, practically speaking, uh, ultrasound, uh, these are the sound waves, and as we can see, they um, constitute of, um, um, so as the sounds kind of propagate into the medium, uh, you have an amplitude of that sound wave, and then that can also, you have a wavelength. And then the cycle basically is what defines the frequency. So the frequency is actually the number of oscillations or the cycles per second. And these sound waves are being subjected to rarefaction and compression. Um, the sound, as we all know, has uh, different velocity in different tissues. So what we are interested in in echocardiography, since we are imaging the uh, skin and the subcutaneous tissue, is actually the fixed velocity of 1.5 meters per second. So that is the sound of the velocity in soft tissue. Uh, as we said, the frequency, which is the number of cycles per second, is a feature that's exclusive to the echo transducer or the probe that we are all familiar with. And the frequency will determine the signal strength and the image resolution. So if we have a lower frequency probe, we will have a better signal but the disadvantage of that is that the sound waves will not propagate further down. Um, I'm sorry, they will propagate further down into the tissue, so you will have more penetration, but unfortunately, the downside is that you will degrade your image resolution. Um, while if you use a higher frequency probe, so the higher frequency probe will not travel further down in the subcutaneous tissue, but the, the good side is that you will have a better image resolution um, in that setting. So this is basically your typical uh, two-dimensional uh, transducer, and these transducers, they have in them those piezoelectric crystals that when they are subjected to uh, um, electrical energy, they're actually able to transmit and receive sound waves, and that's basically what gets digitized and what you see on your uh, screen uh, from the echo machine. So the basics of echo is that we're generating images from reflected sound waves. So those probes are transmitting the sound waves and then we are waiting for them to come back and what we are, uh, the image is being, is it being created from those reflected sounds. And what the transducer does, it actually records the time that it takes for those sound waves to go down to the tissue of interest and come back. And since we have a fixed speed of the sound in the tissue, which is 1.5 meters per second, now only factor that we have to key in is the distance um, from the time the image uh, or the, old, the sound kind of got emitted from the probe and basically received. And that's how it's able or how the machine is able to calculate the location of the structure that you are imaging. So a two-dimensional echo, what you actually have is a rapid repetitive scan line. So these are all ultrasound scanning lines along many different radii within an area. We call it kind of the sector. That's basically the area that we are imaging. And you're able to obtain a live or a real-time image of the heart is being produced after those ultrasound waves are being analyzed and digitized. Um, so this is one display, which is the two dimension. Now we have another display in echocardiography called the M mode, which stands for motion display. So here what we are doing is that we're only looking at a one dimension and we are looking at cardiac structures that are moving. And practically speaking from that ultrasound probe, I'm only gonna assign one crystal to transmit the image and basically receive that image. And what we use this M mode for commonly is for rapidly moving structures. Uh, commonly is basically valve leaflets, uh, uh, myocardial wall, etc. So if you think about it, this is my ultrasound probe and I'm a, a single dimensional image that I'm generating. So one crystal is sending an image and it's actually receiving back that image. And all what I'm interested in is basically the motion of this pendulum. So what I'm gonna get in time, a time motion display of this pendulum as it basically swings back and forth. While if I have a two dimensional image, remember these are repetitive scan lines within a sector width and then what I'm able to see is actually in real time, the motion or actually the display of that pendulum swinging in real time through the whole spectrum of the uh, uh, sector that I'm imaging. Now, um, nowadays, ultrasound probes actually, whether transthoracic or transesophageal echo, they have three dimensional capabilities. So here, instead of having a single or a two dimensional scan line, no, here I'm actually gonna be imaging a whole volume of tissue. 
So these are no longer gonna be individual scan lines. These are gonna be a big volume. If you think about this as like a pyramid, this is the base of the pyramid, this is the apex of the pyramid. This is a uh, real-time uh, transesophageal echo in 3D for the mitral valve. So that's the anterior leaflets, that's the posterior leaflet, this is the aortic valve, and you can actually nicely see there is a flail leaflet in that posterior mitral valve. So you actually now have more in-depth knowledge because now you have the whole volume that you are imaging. Now, Doppler effect is actually quite um, uh, fascinating. So um, he's a uh, Austrian physicist um, way back in the 1800. And what he was actually, what he came up with is a very elegant uh, equation. It's actually named after him, the Doppler equation or the Doppler shift. So if you think about it, I have red blood cells that are moving towards the transducer. So what is that gonna cause? It's gonna cause more compression of the sound waves. And if I think about those red blood cells and they are speeding up, then basically it's gonna, if you're listening to it, so imagine your ultrasound probe is you're here, you're listening to it, you're gonna have a much higher pitch. So what he proposed is that those uh, faster moving objects will actually create more shift within the frequency between what I'm sending, so this is basically your sending originating frequency, and this is what you're receiving. I'm receiving more signals back than what I'm sending. So you have that shift or the difference between those two frequencies. And that's actually what he proposed in his equation for the Doppler shift, and he basically takes into account the velocity of the red blood cells, and also uh, um, by doing that, you're actually able to assess by, uh, the, um, um, so by determining the velocity of the structure that you're interested in, which actually in uh, echocardiography is the red blood cells, I'm able actually to appreciate a difference in frequency, and that's basically what he uh, uh, proposed. Uh, also, the other advantages in echocardiography is hemodynamics. So actually, Bernoulli came up with an equation by which if I have a moving structure, so red blood cells um, at, within a special conduit, so within the blood vessels, so if I have basically the pressure times the velocity of this moving structure, and it's basically going across a certain lumen or certain diameter, then basically you're gonna have a subjected acceleration of that. So what he proposed is that there is a pressure difference uh, between the uh, originating and the receiving chambers. And by using the velocity of those moving structures, I'm able, I'm able to generate or translate those velocities into pressure. So basically what he proposed is that if I have a pressure difference between P2 and P1, that actually equates to four times the velocity square of that moving structure, assuming that we have actually taken or canceled everything out, like the viscous friction of the moving objects, the flow acceleration, and convective acceleration. So all this is kind of the original Bernoulli equation, but the modified one that we commonly use, we're able to derive pressure from velocity. Um, so this is a slide from Dr. Zagby, but uh, echocardiography has uh, um, um, we have had a significant revolution ever since the M mode was actually invented way back in the 1970s uh, to actually three-dimensional echo, and now we actually even have moved to handheld echo. So now you have echo available at bedside to supplement your physical examination skills, and you tend to get a lot of information. This was a recent review article that we put together in circulation, and there is, a, there is an ample of devices nowadays in the market that gives you very nice two-dimensional imaging, very nice color Doppler. Uh, they still have, have limited functionality uh, in terms of spectral Doppler. Um, but, um, so what are the common use of echocardiography? I'm just gonna show in the next five minutes some brief examples of how, what echo is good at. So it's excellent in basically chambers, size and function, whether the atria or the ventricles. In evaluation for cardiomyopathy, for basically LV size and function, you can also get hemodynamics, so you're able to measure left atrial pressure, left ventricular and diastolic pressure, um, valvular heart disease, echocardiography is your first imaging modality, and also patients with um, uh, pericardial disease, whether effusion, constriction, tamponade, echo is gonna be your first uh, to-go test, and endocarditis, um, combining echo, transthoracic and transesophageal. So this is actually a patient who has a severe left ventricular hypertrophy, as you can see on this view. So this is the left ventricle, this is the left atrium, and this is here is a parasternal long axis view. So you see a severe concentric left ventricular hypertrophy with what appears to be a preserved ejection fraction. This is a young patient on dialysis who has end-stage renal disease and chronic hypertension. Um, with regards to cardiomyopathies, nowadays this is a contrast-enhanced image, so you inject basically microbubbles, and you're able to appreciate this severely dilated dysfunctional myocardium, so this is a dilated cardiomyopathy. This is a patient uh, with Takotsubo, so you have the apical ballooning uh, with the basal hyperkinesis. This is a patient who has um, severe asymmetrical hypertrophy, so a hokum. 
patient, and this is a patient who has a restrictive cardiomyopathy, so big atria, and you also have increased wall thickness. Nowadays, also, by using echocardiography, and this is by transthoracic, you can actually use your three-dimensional imaging modality in order to kind of cut the left ventricle in all three planes, so short axis and then two double orthogonal long axis views, and you're able to generate three-dimensional derived volumes to accurately assess your left ventricular ejection fraction, and the softwares have become much better nowadays by which they actually have uh, semi-automated border detection. Uh, strain is actually another advance in echocardiography. We're measuring the change in length of those myocardial fibers. So whenever the myocardium contracts, the fibers shorten, and what we are measuring with strain is actually that change uh, in the diameter and length. And this is basically a patient who has the normal strain is less than minus 18%. This is a patient who has severely reduced global longitudinal strain, uh, as we can see. Um, echocardiography is key in valvular assessment. So for aortic stenosis, is actually the first line imaging modality. So you can see here, calcified restricted aortic valve uh, leaflets with preserved ejection fraction. You can see here on a short axis view, severe calcification and thickening of those aortic valve leaflets. And by using the uh, uh, Doppler uh, equation, we are able to measure velocities across the left ventricular outflow tract and across the aortic valve. And that basically will uh, help me assess for aortic valve area for further interventions. This is a patient who has what looks like severely dilated right ventricle, severe right atrial enlargement, and a significantly dilated tricuspid annulus. And if you, this is the two-dimensional image. If you put color through it, you're actually able to appreciate all that blood that's regurgitating back, which is this whole mosaic, uh, into the, the right atrium, suggesting severe tricuspid regurgitation. This is a patient from a uh, transesophageal echo, has this typical fish mouth uh, appearance of the mitral valve. So this is your... Rheumatic heart disease is not common in the U.S., but every now and then in tertiary care centers, you will be su subjected to patients who have this typical severe um, restriction of the posterior leaflet, and they also have typical commissural fusion. So here you can see the anterolateral and the posterior medial commissions are significantly fused and thickened, um, as seen here with the typical hockey sticking appearance. So that's the restriction of the uh, anterior mitral valve leaflet opening because of the commissural fusion. Nowadays, new software is actually with using uh, uh, three-dimensional echo, you're able to generate models. So this is actually an aortic valve model, a mitral valve model, real life, on a, a real time on a patient during trans gel echo, and you can actually see the buttons of the coronary arteries also. So a lot of uh, automation, a lot of machine learning that can be used, utilized these days. Um, moving on to pericardium, this is a patient who has this typical septal diastolic bounce which is actually very suggestive of pericardial constriction. So you see the stuttering uh, and dancing septum, if you want to call it. This is a patient who have a circumferential, very large pericardial effusion with what looks like right ventricular and right atrial collapse. So these are available to you. This imaging modality is available to you at the bedside. You can get a lot of information. This is without applying color, without applying 3D. This is just simple, straightforward, two-dimensional imaging. Uh, you can get all this information. This is a patient who has a severely dilated left ventricle with a large, um, relatively immobile thrombus that's actually sitting in the anterior wall. You see it here on a four-chamber view, so that's the left ventricle, that's the left atrium, and you see it on a short axis view, that's the anterior wall, that's the inferior wall. Um, very impressive. So I guess this actually ends up the session of our cardiac imaging. Thank you all for being here, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, uh, and welcome to Houston again. Thank you.